uh, my name is Philip Verkracht. I'm uh, the coordinator of WOHEC, the Rooster Housing Energy Community Group. Um, and this workshop is about uh, creating a healthy and energy friendly housing stock in Worcester. And this workshop is really a collaboration of two workshop proposals. One is a collaboration between the Worcester Healthy uh, Green and Healthy Home Coalition, represented by the Nixel and Kobe here. Um, Wohek, represented by Halina and myself. But this workshop is the following. I would like to introduce you very briefly about Wohek and what we, what we try to do. Then Kobe and Benito will very briefly talk about the Booster Green and House and Home Coalition. Um, we will have less than four minutes each. Wait, I'm, I'm not finished yet. <laughs> then uh, Alex and Joe will each speak four minutes um, on the democratic processes and best practices. Um, and then Debbie will kick off the discussion. And then 15 minutes before time, and I will keep time, Halina will wrap up the discussion so far. And then we will start to address the three questions, how to connect the three questions that are posed to us by the workshop organizers. So I'm passing around the sign-up sheet for those who are new here, and uh, welcome everybody. Um, so, Wohek started about Wohek Booster Housing Energy and Community Group. Started about three years ago as a meeting of many stakeholders in the city. The city, the Booster Community Action Council, um, many grassroots groups, Stone Soup, Booster Roads, etc. Et and the question basically that we ask ourselves is basically two questions. One is, how to, on a large scale, make sure that all the leaky and old houses in Western could be energy retrofitted up to a scale that we could significantly reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Right? So how to make all these houses more energy uh, efficient. And the second question is how to integrate such, a, such an objective in community development. Yes. So uh, how to make sure that communities whose first interest is not really energy retrofitting, but maybe something else, like maybe education, certainly jobs, employment, uh, maybe crime, maybe uh, um, all, all kinds of other immigration issues, etc. How can we usefully in integrate these, these objectives? So this was, a, this was a one day meeting, and it turned into a three year, up to now three year group, that monthly convenes, and basically, talks about all the initiatives that are going on, how to connect them with each other, um, how to uh, develop policies, how to, how to develop strategies, um, how to develop interesting cases where we can demonstrate issues. Um, now, if you ask us what, what have we achieved, not a lot. Every, everybody says uh, this group needs to stay and needs to continue. But we so far haven't been very successful in actually uh, producing real resu results that, that are measurable. So the question is now how to step up our activities. One idea of this group, this meeting this afternoon, is to bring in new people. Welcome. And uh, we are looking very much forward to hearing your views. So the whole idea is very brief presentations and then amply time for discussion and new viewpoints. The second thing is we would like to organize a, an early March uh, uh, conference um, where, where we bring in uh, all the players in the field, including business, real estate, financial sector, uh, the, the city government, etc., to talk about two things. Basically, what has been achieved in the, in the just last few years in terms of housing retrofitting, but also renewable energy uh, issues, etc. And the second is what should be the strategy for the short term and for the, for the mid-long term uh, to step up this process. Now this conference that we are talking about is not a one-day event. It should be a process, it should be a combination of a process that should start today and that should basically ramp up until early March and then of course have, has a continuation. And Alex and Joel are going to talk uh, about that, that aspect. So let me leave it uh, at this point and then I give the floor to you guys uh, talking about the booster 
Katrina and how she comes for it. My name is Kobe. Um, I work for the Regional Health Council and also uh, the coordinator for the Mr. Green and Healthy Homes Coalition. So, uh, Mr. Green and Healthy Homes Coalition is actually a partner uh, with WOHEC and vice versa, WOHEC has been you know, a partner with us. But our coalition started a few years ago in 05 as Worcester Land Action Collaborative. At that point in time, our you know, city had you know, a near epidemic mode of lead poisoning. So people came around together to actually talk about ways that we can eliminate lead you know, from our homes. We've been successful over the years with the help of the city of Worcester, where we've achieved a couple of uh, money from the federal government, housing and urban development, to do lead abatement work. In 2010, um, we started having a strategic plan about if there is no lead in our home, does that mean are we safe? Probably not. There is other environmental health, you know, aspects in the home that could be equally, you know, as dangerous as health. So we talk about pests. We talk about, you know, um, chemical, you know, products that we use at home, mold, mildew. There's a lot of components and a lot of research say we spend you know, about 8% of our time in our home. So we moved to the idea of Worcester Green and Healthy Homes Coalition, you know, doing a comprehensive overview including lead poisoning issues in the community. Where have we been working? We've been working in our five low income you know, neighborhoods in Worcester particularly. Why? Because police matters. You know, a lot of the environmental health um, problems that we found um, in our community can be placed to where we live and also socioeconomic status. So the five particular low-income neighborhoods in our city, we've been working, you know, to actually empower people, educate more people, and actually extend resources that we have to people so that you know they can actually help get more knowledge and also eliminate all these you know environmental health um, situations in the home. So our goal for the Worcester Green and Healthy Homes Coalition is creating you know an environment where families and children could have you know, a free um, from, you know, all the toxins that we found in our urban environment. Why is it necessary? Because um, we think, you know, by doing that, we empower community and the community also becomes part of us. More recently, we've been looking at, you know, how can we incorporate, you know, energy efficiency into the work that we do. And, you know, as uh, WOHEC has been uh, a community leader in energy efficiency talking, we thought it was a good idea to see how we can bring environmental health issues and energy efficiency all together. So Worcester Green and Healthy Homes has been around you know, since 2005 and our goal here is that what is the vision moving forward, how can we create a community with more environmental friendly you know, things at home, besides that also have some aspect of energy efficiency in our homes. So um, we are happy to be here and we are happy to also have some discussions and um, I'm here with my colleague Benito and Benito is also going to add a few more things about how he's been doing, organizing and bringing you know, some um, community members to the work that we do at uh, Mr. Green and Healthy Homes Coalition. Well, thank you, Kobe. Thank you all for being here and great explanation. But yeah, um, transitioning to the Worcester Green and Healthy Homes Coalition, you know, it was a process that took about 18 months. You know, a conversation um, stood out and like Kobe mentioned, our concentration was lead, mainly was on lead poisoning and prevention. But as connecting with the community, going out there, having these conversations, these one-to-one -one conversations, door-to-door, -door, focus groups conversations, um, with people directly affected in the five lowest income neighborhoods that we concentrate on, we found out that lead wasn't the only issue there. You know, that's asbestos, radon, rodents, um, energy issues, you know, abandoned buildings, litter. So that's where the Worcester Green and Healthy Homes Coalition came about. But connecting with these folks um, in these five low income neighborhoods, you know, sometimes can be challenging because a lot of them are so used to the system being the way it is that they just don't want to speak up. So we try to bring the conversation to them intentionally, trying to draw out some information to them and encouraging them to play a role at this table, to actually speak up. That way we know as a whole how to work together to make our neighborhoods more greener, more safer, more energy efficient. Um, but again, it's challenging. Sometimes it can be very challenging, especially to the refugees and immigrant communities to where, you know, folks just don't want to speak up. You know, and the only way we do that is by the diversity that we have in this coalition. We go together um, to let folks know that we're working in this together. 
you know, a lot of folks get scared because some of our partners are, are the city officials. But actually, you know, they sit around this table to address some of these concerns and uh, the suggestions that we have to bring forth a more green and sustainable housing. So, you know, some of this work is on underground work, a lot of, a lot of relationship building, a lot of coalition building, and encouraging members of the community to actually play a role at these tables. And this is why we're having these discussions. We're looking forward to hear more from what other groups are doing, what we could do better to encourage folks to speak up. But that's uh, most of the work that we do. And we try to advertise this through everywhere and any place we can to let folks know that we're here and we should work on it together as a team, not as we have all the assets because we don't. So um, that's what uh, my role is at the REC. Thank you, Benito. And uh, thank you, Toby. And uh, we move directly on to Alex and Joel. Well, yeah, I work with a number of group in Boston. It's based, it's, uh, our, my office is in Boston, but it's a national organization called Clean Water Action. And uh, we're part of a statewide coalition called the Green Justice Coalition. Um, so I'd like to speak to you about some of the work that we've done around energy efficiency around the state uh, through this coalition. Um, a few years ago, you know, people from, people who were thinking about the divisions between progressive communities, you know, different, like, like uh, progressive constituencies. There's uh, community groups, the group, groups that are based in specific communities, and then there's labor unions, uh, you know, workers' rights organizations, and then there's uh, environmental organizations. But we often find ourselves competing with each other when it comes to, you know, like a project that a developer puts up. You know, the, the developer will say, we want to build this project, invest all this money, the unions will say, great, you know, you have to hire union people. The, the environments will say, oh, no, you can't do that. There's, there's uh, all these problems, you know, the runoff and, the, you know, pollution and whatever. And then uh, community groups will say, well, you know, the, the unions are racist and they don't give us jobs. And, you know, there's so many conflicts, right? So the idea was how can we work together to build campaigns that benefit everybody and that we, we grow our strength, you know, and, and over time the state uh, moves in a progressive direction. And that's the kind of base of the Green Justice <coughs> Coalition. The first campaign we identified was around energy efficiency. The, the state, uh, the new governor came in, Deval Patrick, and almost immediately, with the help of all these advocacy groups, passed uh, three very important laws that created a, a, a very advanced energy efficiency system for the state. And it set requirements for how much energy will be saved over time, um, the, the conditions for jobs, you know, green jobs creation, um, those those kinds of kinds of things, um, and so you know we we recognize that in, in speaking with our members, you know, workers and community members and, and so on, that uh, a lot of people who would like to participate in the state's energy efficiency programs um, to you know weatherize your home, to save money on your bills and and energy in the uh, you know, the, the, the climate emissions and so on, uh, don't either don't know about the, the opportunities that exist, about the rebates that you can get for doing this work in your home, or they can't afford it. Even if they know about it, they, they cannot afford uh, bec because of the way the structure is set up. So we, and, and those are mostly the, like, you know, low to moderate income folks, you know. I can speak more if, if anybody's interested in that. Um, so, you know, we, we identified that group as, as in particular need of, of, uh, of uh, getting access to these programs, and the campaign has been around that um, specifically. And, you know, pilots have happened in different cities around, this, around the state and have shown that there are very good solutions that uh, can come out of this. The state just released a three-year plan uh, to, 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 you know, on how, how this energy efficiency system is going to work in the next three years. And it includes a lot of the solutions that the Green Justice Coalition has has developed. So that's kind of some background about GJC. Great. Thank you. Again, Joel, also with Clean Water Action. Um, what I want to do is try to connect some of these the GJC ideas back to the municipal level. Um, so, you know, what you hear is that there's low-income groups, communities of color, immigrants, non-English speakers, renters that aren't able to access these energy programs. Um, Part of that is just like they're not getting information, but the same thing goes that when there are processes in place that plan the, you know, what's going to happen in a city, in a state, in a county, whatever, um, 
like what, what the processes they're going to plan, what's going to happen next. Um, in the same way that they're not receiving information, those same populations would be not necessarily given voice at the table unless someone comes to them and invites them there. So um, from my perspective, I, I live in Dorchester, and Dorchester you know, is a community that has often been left out in some ways of you know, the table. The, the exact same populations, in fact, some of the Green Justice Coalition partners um, represent those constituencies. And so hearing about healthy homes, hearing about energy in uh, Worcester, I really personally identify and want to like, you know, bring whatever, whatever I can to, to um, help you think about that and, and to learn from you as well. But um, what in, in my, like looking at the green justice work, looking at energy, and then looking at municipalities across the state, I found an interesting case study in what the city of Lowell has done personally. Which um, city? I'm sorry. Lowell. Lowell. Yeah. So you have gateway cities across the across the, the Commonwealth. These former industrial towns. They share a lot of the same uh, strengths, and they share a lot of the same social issues, environmental health issues, economic issues, transit issues. All these different things. Um, they're all diverse cities, um, and because of a lot, especially because of a lot of the laws that Massachusetts has passed, there's this incentive um, to green the municipality. And what does that really mean? Well, one thing it means is that. The, to, to qualify for certain kinds of funding and to look good, like the city has to um, put forward sustainability plans. So you have all these different um, officials scrambling and, and residents scrambling to come up, well, what does it mean to be green? What does it mean to um, plan for a city? How are we going to do that? Um, so I would argue, just from talking to, to different city officials, to residents, um, that there are some techniques that will allow you to include more people in that process. And if you include them in the process, of planning, they're going to, you know, be be at the table for the implementation as well, and that's really important. So, um, just like one one uh, applying some basic community organizing principles, I think, to community planning is is how this works. And in Lowell, one of the things that happened is it said, okay, we had a master plan, now we want a sustainability plan. So how are we going to do that? Well, we need to know what residents care about. So let's go out and have community meetings. Let's get some. Uh, a couple of different topic issues, some of the big, you know, economy, transit, you know, just a number of them, and have meetings across the city. Let's, you know, pull up charts so when people come out to those meetings, um, you know, have, have, have multilingual translated meetings and have people just put stickers on the different, uh, different, you know, comments that they have so that you can see, okay, well, here's the ten different things that people at this meeting said. And this one, wow, people really care about this issue. And have that for all these different topic areas. So you get a sense of what are the big problems here. Now they went, they, they went on from that, this very, um, you know, very simple process of putting a sticker next to a, this is a problem area too. Okay, well, we're going to make it transparent. So we have these meetings in these locations across the city on these issues, and that's going to go on the website, and we're going to have a picture of it there. So anyone can see what residents in different areas were thinking. Okay, so then they go on and they take a uh, technological tool. Um, I personally, and a little anecdote, I went to Emerson College in Boston. There's a professor there who's invented a tool called Community Planet. And it's a really interesting way of kind of combining social networking and saying, this is what I want to see in my community, and this is how I can invade, engage in events around. So they use that tool um, in combination with their sustainability planning process to try to take technology and like smart ways of gathering input on different issues um, and make it accessible. So, in, you, you know, you can host you can host meetings or events across the city, get input, and then see what other people are thinking as well. And if you have you know translation, and you have you know the young and the, the like youth and senior citizens and and the city and community working together, that's a situation where it's conducive to dialogue. And you at the end you have a product you can witness, and you've engaged all these people in the process. So I just think that when you're talking about it, doing this this kind of work on the municipal level. Um, that's, there's some really interesting things you can do, both just with simple processes, but also with technology that's readily available to use. Um, and I think that that is what really is going to reach the biggest constituency possible. So I know like you have a round table here, and it sounds like you've done amazing work with just gathering people to the table. But I think it's, um, it's just cool to think about what, um, what's there and what other people have done, and, and what tools, like, it's literally like these things don't have to be invented. There are, there are tools, um, both of communication simple, like, how are we going to get input and, and technology that's been you know programmed that you can use to do this? That's my thoughts. Thank you very much, Thank you. Have an interest in houses and kind of, kind of see what kind of work is going on and some ideas. But.
a lot of beautiful houses around that go go to waste, and it's been interesting to see what kind of community response could maybe. Kind of so, what is your immediate response to what we have been telling you? Um, well, it's yeah. I mean, it's a tricky issue, like you said, to kind of create tangible results. I mean, how do you really get out there and do that? I guess that's what I'm kind of looking forward to. Is like what are some ways that will benefit the community, not benefit the developers or the other folks, or the, you know, so it doesn't become gentrified so much that the people who are there can have a can benefit from, you know, saving the stock. So. Do your students do, I know some um, folk schools actually go out and like build it, you know, they have a project where they go build a house. Or right, they do building projects. Rehab would be a little trickier just because of health issues and there's certain limits on what students can do. So to get students to go to do rehab, is, that's a little more problematic. But in terms of, you know, if they have a housing project, are you looking at energy efficiency and mm -hmm. new technologies? I know you were talking earlier right. about the solar session mm -hmm. and, yeah. and incorporating that, because that, that can also get the conversation started at least. Uh -huh. You know, get right. people thinking about those things. Right. Yeah, it'd really be expanded in the social studies question of, you know, access to housing and what's decent and affordable. And, in healthy housing, so you know, kind of bring that into the bigger, the bigger, the wider curriculum would be. Yeah, that well. that's a, that's an interesting idea. I think uh -huh. you know, take it out of the, the shop scene and go mm -hmm. into the classroom with it too, and how to make a a community action thing out mm -hmm. of it that you know maybe the students can get involved at that grassroots level, kind of what Joel was talking about, mm -hmm. and sharing it and. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, okay. You want to introduce yourself? So. Okay. I'm. My name is Grace Chang. I do um, environmental justice research um, at UMass, and I'm also involved with um, popular economics education with um, the Center for Popular Economics that Emily Kawano, who spoke at the plenary, is the director of. Um, and um, I, I also just moved to Holyoke, so I'm just very interested in Holyoke, Massachusetts. So. I'm, you know, kind of interested just on a personal level, um, you know, just taking a look around the city and the housing stock there, um, you know, what, what there's just so many possibilities, um, it seems, but I don't have the ideas, so I'm just sort of curious um, about what things you have done already. But I, I did have a question for Joel about access to information. Um, you know, for a lot of these lower income communities, um, you know, if they, if they can't afford um, the technology, you know, like cell phones and things, how do they have? How do they get access to, to information other than you know, the door to door work that you do in the community? I mean, many of them may be illiterate. I I think, I mean, really like I bring this up is trying to apply the green justice model that Alex talked about to um, some of the municipalities. And I think that one of the things that's always been key or like where there have been successes is trusted community. Someone that's already trusted gets engaged. Right. In other words, like that more than language, more than um, literacy, it's like trust because you can, like, that's the thing, like, will I actually have this conversation? With you? Right. So, I mean, if there's a population you need to reach, who do they, like, you know, who do they, who, who is the trusted, like, who is appropriate to really reach that population? And mm -hmm. how do they get the resources to do really targeted outreach? Who can they, who can they partner with? I don't know if there's... <laughs> yeah. So... Well, I was just thinking there's a limit to electronic and social media technology. Yeah. Maybe many of the folks in these communities, so then... Yeah. A team? Yeah. Um, that you were able to actually reach out to these communities and actually be received with, you know, with maybe less suspicion than if you were not a diverse bunch. And so I'm wondering who, who else is um, doing this outreach work? As far as art? to where it's hard to get the landlord association involved right. to actually you know, be able to rehab and uh, make your home energy efficient because some of them are just in it for the profit. Mm -hmm. you know? yeah. So that's the challenging part and that's where you know, Kobe and myself, um, we wrap our heads around this, how can we target this population, this group of folks and invite them to the table to take advantage of these resources so the folks in the low to moderate income neighborhoods and communities can actually benefit and be able to save some money in the long run. Mm -hmm. 
Right. You know, that's yeah. where our challenge is right. Yeah, I was, I was just curious if you had any sense of the numbers of, you know, the percentage of folks in these five, you know, neighborhoods who are, you know, people of color, um, or, you know, are they, are they undocumented Im immigrants, a lot of them, and how many of them are, you know, homeowners, actually? Are most of them renters? Well, um, no specific numbers, but you, those five, you know, income neighborhoods are pretty much um, high minority, you know, mostly um, African, Latino, Asian communities. Mm -hmm. um, you know, most of their, you know, census data uh, from, you know, the facts find that, you know, depict that, you know, you have low level of education compared to um, other um, areas in Worcester, mm -hmm. low income, high unemployment, you know, youth, you know, violence. Um, so these are, you know, predominantly, you know, low income and, you know, high minority area, you know, and most right. of the time uh, excluded from a lot of, you know, the decision making that, you know, goes on at, you know, City Hall. Mm -hmm. you, you have a question? Yeah, you know, Don't have yeah. specific, you know, but right. most of them are not, you know, right. homeowners. So most of them are renters and more recently, you know, we uh, did a project with um, on energy efficiency with um, what was it uh, name in Boston? Um, next step. Next step. No. Uh, okay. In two thousand and ten, we worked with Mass Energy, Mass Energy uh, Consumer Alliance in, in Boston, and one of the reasons that we find was that we were doing a lot of outreach to connect folks to the energy efficiency, um, you know, through mass save and, you know, national grid. And what we found out was that, even though, as Benio said, a lot of the community, uh, regardless of, you know, your socioeconomic status and where you live, are paying into the system. So it's a benefit charge program. They, they okay. deduct you a couple of dollars from your, uh, you know, utility bills, and in turn, you get this energy efficiency. Mm -hmm. Guess what? Even though they might have a utility bill in their name, yeah. They don't get to do the energy efficiency because yeah, there is a barrier between them and the landlords. Right. And mm -hmm. most of the time they are interested. And sometimes mm -hmm. even National Grid or Massive will tell you we gotta get a consent from the landlord before we can do anything. Right. So they keep, you know, contributing to the system, but then they don't have access to the and who are getting them the most affluent, you know, middle class, rich mm -hmm. neighborhoods are the ones who can exactly. easily tap because they are the homeowners, you know. Exactly. So that is the, you know, bridge that we find in how to connect folks from low income areas to these, you know, energy efficiency programs. The state program has been, has, has you know, mandated goals set uh, by these laws from 2008 on how much energy they're supposed to save. And they're finding that they're not able to meet those goals, you know, they're not able to do the outreach necessary to bring people in to participate to save those, you know, just on a purely climate level. So, if if, if we're going to meet those goals, this this mandate that's been set by the laws, we're going to have to bring in these communities. They live in, you know, the, usually the leakiest, like at least energy efficient housing stock in around, you know, mm -hmm. and there's very clear barriers to their participation that you know it's it's not difficult to identify. You know, they, there's financial barriers, language barriers, outreach, you know, all that. So one clear solution is to bring in partners partner partner up with community groups to do outreach that's appropriate it's that whatever the however you know that they usually reach their folks whether it's technology you know or, or whatever i think the example of the, the technology that joel was talking about is just it's it's a broader thing about like the frame of this conference is about participatory planning you know and and it's not it's, this example in lowell is where there's a very progressive administration that wanted to do something a particular way and it was kind of top down and you know it was it was Participatory brought the community in, and they did a good job with accountability and so on. But most places are not like that, you know. How, how, so the question is, how do we do it when when you were in an environment that's not that friendly? And uh, and and so the, the idea of this technology is that there are some tools that we can use to bring people in to get to, to get people talking to each other. Not everyone's going to feel comfortable using those tools, but it's just it's just one way. I I would like to tip it on from this point. Uh, it's basically two remarks. One is you were talking about utilities, and I think that in here in Worcester we have an opportunity because National Grid is very active. It's the Smart Grid project here, so they created this this group called uh, Green to Growth. They bring together most of the stakeholders <coughs> that are used also to, to come together in in Wohek. Uh, basically talking about the Smart Grid, but also about community issues there. Now I don't know if you guys.
are involved in, in this Green to Growth pro project. You are? So we, we attended the conference and I think um, one of our other colleagues um, yes. have the Green to Growth. So actually Debbie has been to one or more of their, their meetings. We, we intend to at least connect with them to see how we can get the utilities uh, better into maybe this type of process. The other, uh, the other remark I want to make is really very critical of the local authorities here in Booster, because I really admire your story about Lowell, and, and I would like to challenge John O'Dell, who spoke this morning, uh, to, to basically allow something to happen here in Worcester. Um, what happened here in Worcester is that uh, the city of Worcester got about $800,000 from the Green Community Act. Um, and John O'Dell was part of WOHEC, so we had all these monthly conversations about energy retrofitting. Um, we were kept totally outside the process of how this money was going to be spent. It's actually going to be spent on housing retrofits. So about 100 houses will get a 5,000 subsidy for uh, energy retrofits. But um, that's it. I mean, there's no community involvement as far as I know. There's no research being done about uh, how to handle, for instance, the, the issue that, uh, that you're talking about, uh, about the, the, the renter owner uh, split incentive, right? How to, how to handle this? This is purely doing 100 houses full stop. And at the end of the program, we don't know anything more than we knew in the beginning. And of course, such a process should set up in a way that would include communities, uh, in, including uh, communities of color and immigrants, etc., that would address the, the issues not just of insulation of houses, but also health and also other aspects that we've been talking about. And it should be studied. It should be there should be research to study about which things work and which things don't work. So I'm very critical of the of the city of Worcester at this point. But as some of you could hear in the previous workshop, I challenged John uh, to basically to top down facilitate a bottom up process. That's what I learned yesterday from Alex on the phone, and I think that it's a great model that could could be. Um, uh, uh, it could be handled here in Booster, but uh, it has not been done so far. I wanna, so, yeah, I just, I just want to throw a couple other like things, maybe things to think about that that have happened. Um, <coughs> one, can, can, I, can, can you maybe hold one moment because I would like to introduce oh, please. to uh, to have another voice on the table and then yeah, thank you. Oh, um, my name is Shi, and I'm currently a graduate student in Clark. My major is environmental science and policy. And also, I'm an intern at Regional Environmental Council. I work with Benino and Kobe at the Weatherized Worcester project. So mm -hmm. I'm interested in their energy efficiency in Worcester. So that's why I came to this meeting and want to know more about how to do outreach work to communities and what's the situation now about the energy efficiencies in Worcester. And do you have a question or a comment on the discussion so far? I had a question for Joe. And you just mentioned that you <coughs> uh, you use some technology to make the information, like make the same information from mayor and from resident and then put the information to the society. I want to know why you, why you address that we should have the same information from mayor and resident. I mean, you you said you you will set ten questions, and then you want to know how mayor responds to this question, and you want to know how resident responds to this question, and then and then put this these responses to to the society. I want to know uh, why you want to do that. Uh, no, I don't think that that's. If I'm understanding you correctly, um, uh, I'm not. I'm not sure that I maybe perhaps I didn't explain clearly what the example is, um, and I, I don't want to like go into a huge long process. But basically, it's it's just that when it's not what the mayor thinks and what the residents think. It's that polling residents on on topics that have been indicated as important through community outreach, and then making that information available so other residents can see it. 
and having the city show people what other people in the city are thinking as a way of facilitating dialogue. So this would be one thing from the top of my head that you can imagine a city could do. Are there other things that could a city could do in order to facilitate these bottom-up processes that we are talking about? Yeah, like that process that you mentioned. Um, I also think one of the things that probably um, not just the city of Worcester, but you know every city that has the um, you know mass save energy or the process to do with that. You know why should they need consent from? the landlord to actually have their home, you know, so since um, the utility companies is kind of, you know, collecting all this money on behalf of the city, one thing the city can do is that eliminate that type of, um, you know, barrier that, you know, because the guys, you know, on the top floor is paying as much as you are paying, so why do they have to get your consent so they can make it easier? On eliminating that, you know, type, because you know he also pays into the system. <coughs> so that's one thing from a city level. Since okay. they are working with, you know, the utility companies, can actually eliminate that type of barrier. Mm -hmm. Or yeah, or on that note, taking that same funding that they using, a dollar sixty eight from the National Grid is huge, and I'm sure that that money, it's you know, on a daily basis, there's millions of dollars going into this account. So why not make some of that funding available for the people under the 60% uh, income threshold to where you can't benefit, it? or even if you're a, a homeowner, but yet fall under this income level to where you can't afford the $10,000. You know, and for an example, my house, when they audited my house, there's nothing that can be done to them until I, I change the um, electrical wiring. In the whole house, which is going to cost another five to seven thousand dollars before any insulation can be ever done. So that's automatically like twelve thousand dollars right there coming out of my pocket, aside from the seventy-five percent discount that I might qualify for. Um, so why not make that that pool of funding available to folks in those brackets? You know, medium to low income homeowners or even residents, as Kobe mentioned, to why do we need a landlord consent to do that? I'm the one paying the gas and electrical bill. Mm -hmm. You'll benefit because your house right now just went up in value because of my my paying high electrical bills. Your house is getting insulated, you know. So. But then don't you also run into problems if there's you know if you get a triple decker and the guy in the middle floor wants to do it, but the guy in the top floor and the bottom floor don't want to, or. Well, the, the way it is now is if two out of three, if at least fifty percent of the residents in a one-to-family home want it. They, they do the whole thing. Oh, yeah. yeah. So, okay. so if it's two out of three, then they'll do it. But they'll if it's just it. one, they won't, they won't do it. Although now we're, we're pushing for them to do that. Yeah, that, that, that's a great. And also the inspection piece. I like that piece to where every time a new homeowner leaves or a new person is coming into an apartment, you know, get the apartment inspected, making sure that, you know, it could have been a bad tenant that lived there that they didn't care, broke the windows, damaged the doors, or whatever the case may be. But make sure the house isn't the apartment or home you're renting out. It's in good standings before anybody else comes in. Um, I like that. I well, or, or at least give them maybe a time frame in which to complete, because I, I could see that might be, a, like you're talking about, it could be a $12,000 bill before you get your next tenant in. Meanwhile, you don't have any income coming in. But if you give them a time frame and you give them some assistance. Right. Well, resources yeah, won't need to be available. Exactly. That renter question is a big thing, you know. Like in some of these cities, like you were, you're talking about what percentage, you know? And in Lowell, is that sixty percent of the housing is is rental units? In Boston, it's something like sixty percent. In almost all all these all the cities, you know, in Massachusetts, it's very high proportion as, as rental. And you have the split incentive. You got the the uh, the renter pays into the thing, you know, into the into the, uh, the the pot of money for this insulation for the weatherization work. But they don't see the benefit, you know. They, the landlord gets the benefit. If the work gets, and they don't have the decision-making power to, to make the decision to have the work get done, it's all in the landlord's hands. So you know, this, it's not fair, right? But uh, it's it's got to be fixed. And one in Boston, what was really effective was they used money from the the federal government during the uh, what was that thing, the ARA uh, yep. stimulus, you know. Stimulus. Yep. The it was a big pot of money they gave to all these municipalities, and they took that money. And they said, we'll pay for anybody who wants it that's less than 120% of it. Less than 120%. You know, anybody who's not like wealthy, right? 
will pay that 25% copay for you. And it was fantastic. I mean, it was sold out. Like it was, it was. They had more work than they could do. So people got jobs. There was all this job creation, all this uh, climate savings, all this you know energy savings, uh, and and you know the the program. We, we they showed that that 25% barrier is is a real obstacle to meeting our, our own goals. So yeah, the, the, the big question is if the stimulus money runs out, this yes. program runs yeah, out, yeah, right? Yeah. So somehow it has to come from the private sector uh, or from private fund, funding. Yeah, yeah. What you, about... You have, to, you have, she had a question. Uh, oh, no, I just had a comment. You asked what, what can the city do to... to, yeah. to, to um, one thing you could do is sort of make progressive, more progressive, the, the incentive structure that you described. So if you did research and you found out that 120% of the medium income, you know, is what you have to be in order to afford that 25% payment. Well, then just change the structure and make make the qualification, you know, have you, have higher. Have you been reading the Green Justice Coalition? No. The <laughs> and then have you been reading the tiered rebate? <laughs> <laughs> it's also, you know, you could make different tiers. So you do increase whatever from 60 to 80,000. Anyone, you know, below 80,000 median gets 100%. And then, you know, 80 to, I don't know. 125 and get 50% and then why should someone who kind of you know makes a million dollars a year dollars a year anything yeah. you know just use that savings and redistribute that to the people who really need it yeah it sounds like communism you know I mean it's also they don't want to do the work you know it's like oh we have to go change the whole system you know? but um, it's definitely a, it may, it's an obvious solution so the state actually listens to you right and, well, I mean, you people who have case, done this yeah. work in the, uh, you actually go from door to door, right? To, you know what's going on. It's a very interesting finding, right, mm -hmm. that they made. Are they are they interested in knowing what you learn out there on the street? <laughs> it's taken years of like showing up at the meetings, their their monthly meetings, where nobody goes to these things except you know the utility suits and like these kind of people, right? And like some you know there's a few academics who are interested in that kind of thing. But nobody usually goes to this from the, the stakeholder groups, the community groups that are most affected. And we would show up every month. We do research about you know this and this and this, and we have findings. And we'll sometimes at Halloween we'll, or you know Valentine's Day, we'll, we'll, we'll hand out candy to everybody, and you know like that kind of thing. And so they know that we're not going away, and they know that we have demonstrated some solutions. So now they're starting to use our language. You know, it really is. A huge victory, really, for a, a kind of a grassroots strategy, um, and it's a huge pot of money. We're, we're talking about a billion and a half to two billion dollars over over time. About, um, I'm thinking of the education piece here and, and the school involvement, and I'm I'm thinking, well, you know, like I remember when they they created a Stop Smoking Day or whatever they called it, you know, and. You came home from school or you had pieces of paper and you shared with your parents and we were talking before about how the kids sometimes are what facilitate and what if we're able to get some kind of energy efficiency curriculum into the school as part of the the school year and and this doesn't help kid, the people without kids but i'm guessing that most people have kids and they came home with a project that required them to do a certain amount of work and, and expose the family a certain amount to programs or figuring out at least what they're spending on electricity or on heat or, I don't know. I just sort of was starting down that line and want to throw it out there and see what it develops things. I think it, it makes, you know, you make a very good point because, um, you know, the other aspect you know of the energy efficiency thing that we can really think about is you know the education piece as you you mentioned there's a lot of research that actually attributes you know the amount of energy that we pay in a home you know to waste and you know one of the things that we can do as you know through the school program is that how can we educate you know these young people and then they can in turn educate their money how many times do we have our cell phone you know plugs in files, you know, without using them, you know, computer games. Oh, I saved my game, I continue later, but, you know, four days later, still, you know, the, um, you know, the console is still running. So there's a lot of uh, things that we can do, which are very smaller, but, you know, all coming together, I think it will make, you know, some good impact. And one of the things that we can do is that through the school system, because the school system has 
a recycling program that you know it allows kids to come home and you know tell mommy daddy about like how great you can recycle and I think we can also use the same model of you know education piece you know through youth and then in turn you know spread the word at home you know I think that could be something you know on a smaller scale but you know we can do a lot of education on um, you know home energy efficiency. Also, once the kids are aware of the problem, as they grow up, they're going to spot the problem more and more, and they're going to bring it up more and more, and it's going to grow. That was true. Culture and I don't know whether Mass Safe could go into the schools, but you know maybe there could be something that could go home, you know, as part of the curriculum to to let the, the people that don't have the TVs and the computers and the fancy phones to know that, yeah, you can call this phone number and find out about a program that maybe will help you save energy, you know, as your kid just learned about class. Or yeah, the, the, the utility companies have like hundreds of staff, you know, who with like business degrees and all that stuff. And, and despite that, they haven't, you, the solutions that we hear, heard here today are like more than what they've been able to think on, their, on by themselves, okay. you know. So this is, this is a solution that as part of the commitment to like, you know, Diversifying the outreach methods, uh, we advanced with the EAC, with the Energy Efficiency Advisory Council, and uh, they put it into the new three-year plan. Something you should mention. So they, so they've actually done a pretty good job. They haven't been specific about budget, how much they want to devote to it, but they're talking about uh, you know developing curriculum, sponsoring science fairs, uh, like having a like going to summer camps, you know, to have like a presentation about efficiency. Developing like uh, you know games, interactive stuff, toys, that kind of thing. There's, a, there's there's all these ideas out there that they kind of say that they're going to do or are they going to consider, but they haven't talked specifics yet.